Park and well met folks and welcome back to another stream. My name is Rune Meister Chris and welcome to the end of Dino Week here on the Rune Stream. It has been a true pleasure hanging out with you guys this week, playing dinosaur games, talking about dinosaurs, having all that dino fun. It's nice to dabble in the other side every once in a while. As an archaeologist, I am frequently mistaken for a paleontologist. Everybody asks me uh, uh, what sort of dinosaurs I dig up, what my favorite dinosaur is when I tell them that I'm an archaeologist, and I have to go, no. I talk about people, not dinosaurs. But no more, because today, and this whole week, I have been talking about dinosaurs. And now uh, I can no longer call those people a liar. Today, I think more importantly, we're going to be looking at a blending of the two sciences. That's right. How can I, an archaeologist, an anthropologist, a person who studies people, look at dinosaurs, uh, which, as we should all know, went extinct some 65 million years ago? Well, the answer is simple. You look at how people have been interpreting, researching, studying, and living with the knowledge of dinosaurs. It's a very, very interesting little rabbit hole that I dug myself down. I have some very cool articles and I have a direction, a path that I want to weave through this. Arc folks, Roommeister Chris here, and I'm very happy to be back making content for all of you. If you could go ahead and hit the subscribe button down at the bottom of your screen, it would be incredibly helpful to the channel and to me for continuing to bring you new content in archaeology, video games, and beyond. The idea that we're going to be looking at today is how have our human interpretations of dinosaurs and dinosaur fossils changed over time? And how has historically the knowledge of dinosaurs and the study of dinosaurs uh, been interpreted? Coincidentally, our, our city is doing a free museum weekend. So yesterday we went to a history museum, just like the local city history museum. And today the natural history museum is doing free tickets. So me and my wife are going to take Blue Eyes White Dragon and we're going to go to the natural history museum and we're going to look at some actual dinosaurs. Once he's in there, it's going to be impossible to get him back out again. Oh, right. The brunch. It's brunch stream, which means that we got to talk about brunch stuff today. I have a little pan seared breakfast burrito, eggs, cheese, bacon. Chipotle Ranch, as always, and barbecue pulled pork. Chipotle Ranch, the official flavor profile of the stream. So, hang on, I'm gonna use tools today. So, the subject of today's discussion is dinosaurs. Dinosaurs, all right? You had the big meaty chompers, and you had the leafy monsters. The meaty chompers and the leafy monsters, meaty chompers, they're called theropods. Theropod dinosaurs. They usually have like the three, the three toe foot. They're usually carnivores. And they are also some of the ones who uh, a lot of modern day birds are descended from. Then you've got the leafy monsters, the sauropods. I think it's like a very broad, I'm speaking in the broadest of categories, and I'm going off of a class that I took in undergraduate way back when. But there are the theropods who are kind of carnivorous. The sauropods are mostly herb herbivorous, herbivorous, Herbiv herbivores. Congratulations, you guys now know close to as much as I know about dinosaurs. Unironically, though, I took that dinosaurs class when I was in freshman year. It was one of the reasons why I got into archaeology later because paleontology had a lot more of a math element to it. And my math is crap. First of all, I slayed that class. Second of all, one of the only things that I really remember are stuff about feet. So my fun fact, like my, my frequent go-to fun fact about dinosaurs is that um, T-Rexes have something called an arctometatarsalian foot structure. That's the one fact that I remember. Let's dive into the nitty gritty, right? The meat and potatoes, the meaty chomps and the uh, leafy manch. There are a lot of crazy cool discoveries that are going on today in the field of paleontology. A fossil found in the Canadian hillside could be a complete dinosaur skeleton with intact skin. 
I love these sort of discoveries because they tell us a crazy amount about dinosaurs that we can't just tell from their, you know, their bones. Stuff that we previously thought wasn't even possible. Top Gunner, my dino fact, the Triceratops you and I grew up with is no longer the same Triceratops of today. Correct. Yeah, they have restructured the idea of the Triceratops and the classification of the Triceratops and other Ceratopsids. I think that uh, they formerly had ideas about what constituted a Triceratops, and then they discovered later it was a splitter versus lumper mentality. They had a whole bunch of different species of Ceratopsids, and then they discovered, oh wait, a lot of these are uh, the same dinosaur at different stages of life. This fossil could be a complete dinosaur skeleton with, in with intact skin. I am particularly excited because Hadrosaur is one of my personal favorite dinos. A Hadrosaur is the duck-billed dino. This is the Hadrosaur. He's like, he's a big, he's a big duck-billed dino. That was what they called him as a kid. He was the, he was the duck-billed dinosaur. So they've got crests that can make like noises. Yeah, they're just kind of all within like this kind of broad category, but they're a lot of fun. The preservation of this fossil is so good that the skin is intact. It's not just the bones that were left behind, but this thing was flash preserved, right? There was an event which caused the fossil to be preserved and not decompose prior to the fossilization process. When you find skin or better internal organs, you can start to look at how these animals were when they were living and breathing. I mean, that's insane to me that they can find internal organs preserved in the fossil record like this and that they can start to piece together some of that stuff. And we're finding this out because of these preserved internal organs, uh, in addition to just like theories and, and studies and, and modern day real world correlations between what we know of similar creatures being able to do. You can see the scaly structure to the picture, which is great because, um, you know, a lot of people are discussing right now about like the ideas of dinosaurs having feathers versus dinosaurs having scaly skin. And it really is kind of more like a blend. If it's preserving the skin and stuff, it would have preserved feathers. And they might discover that as part of the excavation process, but we'll wait and see. So this story reminds me, and I didn't pull up the picture, but I'm pulling this up now because this is a story from a while ago. This one's uh, this one is an Ankylosaurus which I'm sure many of us are familiar with. Ankylosaurus, they have like the big kind of like domed back, a huge club on their tail and they would thwack. Um, they're really great at harvesting metal. <laughs> I'm playing too much Ark. But yeah, these kind of like, I don't know if it's an exact, yeah, it's it's one of the Ankylosaurs, but um, this absolute champ, like this is this is him. This is a photograph. This is actually where they, how they found it. The dino, he just looked like that. It's a dinosaur. It's like, it's literally just right there. This dinosaur fell over and landed upside down in really silty sediment on a river. So it landed in this kind of like very thick, mucky sediment at the bottom of a river, and it quickly became airtight, right? So this, uh, he did not decompose as significantly as other ones. And as that settlement pressured in and pushed and ground down, the rocky elements came in to fill in the gaps. Because once again, uh, uh, none of this is biological. This is all rocky remains of dinosaur. It's where the rock sediment goes in to replace where the biological elements were. Now, there are some people who are studying the possibility that there is genetic material left in some fossils. I remember, I remember hearing a story. I think I pretty much said everything I wanted to say about this dinosaur. It's really cool. So that's what we have going on here in the field of dinosaur paleontology today. We have a better idea now than ever before what dinosaurs were looking like. And for those of you not in the know, we used to think they looked really weird. Here are some retro versus modern interpretations of what dinosaurs looked like. Spinosaurus, of course, being from Jurassic Park 2? 3. Jurassic Park 3. <laughs> it's in Ark. It was in, pa it's in Path of Titans. Back in the early 1900s, when they were looking at dinosaurs for the first time, it was all lizards. They all thought they thought they were lizards. The name Saurus is lizard in Latin. That's like where that comes from. Spinosaurus. It is a lizard with a spine. <laughs> the 90s interpretation looks a lot like how we saw in Jurassic Park 3. But our modern interpretation is so cool. It's so much more aquatic. But now, the, the, the goat, the OG, Tyrannosaurus Rex. T-Rex has had uh, 
what some people might interpret a bit of a glow down, but of course the classic T-Rex, upright, tail dragging, very Godzilla. You've all seen the old black and white dinosaur movies with the T-Rex the T -Rex battling something. By the 90s, of course, the Jurassic Park interpretation of the T-Rex that we all have come to love and know. And then the new T-Rex. Fuzzy Chonker. He's just a big, thick boy. His massive head still playing a big part, but it's a little bit more filled out. It's less of a, you know, it's got less of like a gap in there for the nasal crest. Deinonychus, this is a big one. They had, they did not have much of a change from their first iteration in the 60s to their 90s and 80s interpretation, other than the fact that they look cracked out. You know, our new interpretation of Deinonychus is this little, this little feathered psychopath, which would have been about a human height. I think this is like five foot something is what a Deinonychus is. They're like four to five feet tall, I think. So like we would have been standing at these letters. At like the my my six foot two height would maybe be at like the bottom of this uh, bottom of these letters compared to this thing, which is crazy. But yeah, these guys are these guys are mad lads. And um, so what I'm basically trying to do by by looking at all of these, I'm not really going to go through every single one. Dino Kyrus, not the duck. One of the things that we have done is we have definitely floofed out our dudes. Right, we floofed out our dudes. We've given some of them these kind of feathery uh, uh, interpretations. Other ones keep their knobbly, leathery skin. The, the new interpretation of Quetzals is unreal. It's just it's just a giraffe who decides to fly every now and then. <laughs> Reconstructions during the '90s were considerably less demonic <laughs> compared to this thing. Yeah, it looks pretty sinister compared to this guy. What I'm really trying to highlight here about these changes in interpretations of these of these different creatures. <laughs> little ears. <laughs> the pterodactyl used to have little ears. <laughs> they thought he was a mammal. They thought he was like a bat. And then and then later it was like, Wah! and now it's just kind of like. <laughs> this is like the third time that I'm trying to say this, but I'm going to get it out here. The reason why I'm showing these comparisons of what things used to look like versus what we now think they are. I'm looking at our growing interpretations as a species, as humans. This one's good. Therizinosaur they used to think was a big fingery turtle, and now they know it is a giant sloth chicken. Looking at these interpretations, it's curious to see what that means for us as a species and how our interpretations of dinosaurs are changing and what that means for us and our self-reflectiveness on this. Because back in the early, you know, back in the late 1800s, early 1900s, these dinosaurs were a subject that was unknown. It was a, it was a new avenue, a new field of study. And there was a scary element to that. We looked at these things, we saw sharp teeth, we saw big claws, and they went to some scary real life equivalents, lizards. They started uh, uh, turning them into these sort of ancient monsters. And then in the 90s, we tried to slim down. Everything seemed very skin tight. It all seemed to interpret itself that way. And now we're looking at it more from, we're analyzing more of these scientific interpretations, trying to get the looks at feathers, uh, getting these creatures lined up as they were. Hey, bud, you're back again. That's fine. <laughs> buddy, we're not going to play Minecraft right now. Yeah, we're looking at dinosaurs, bud. Hold on, let me pull up on the... I know you now. How about this guy? Spinosaurus. Spinosaurus. That's exactly right, bud. You did a good job identifying them. Well, bud, I appreciate the visit. We're talking about dinosaurs here. I'm going to let you go, though, because guess what? We are going to go see some dinosaurs later. Yeah, you want to see? You want to you wanna wave? You want to say hi to everybody? Hi. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Did you guys hear him? <laughs> He's running away, he runs upstairs. Minecraft, Minecraft, Minecraft. I want Minecraft, please. <laughs> Moving on, I have here just more studies of our changing evolutionary ideas of how these dinosaurs were interpreted. Eudiranus, which obviously had a lot more feathery type structures now. This one is like mid-jump, I think that's another one down there. It's got longer arms. Lived in very cold climates, which is super cool. It's like a giant snow T-Rex. 
these these interpretations have evolved out of our self-reflection and, and personal development of new scientific methods, new scientific theories. So we are looking at these things less as monsters of the past that we should fear and put on display as like a big show and more like they are, uh, uh, you know, they were the former inhabitants of the planet. They were the they were the kings and queens and everything in betweens of the of the animal kingdom. It's crazy to look at. And as these I mean, just the absolute craziness of our first interpretations of dinosaurs is bonkers to look at. This is Megalosaurus. This is what they thought a Megalosaurus used to look like. But looking at how the Megalos uh, the Megalosaurus obviously nowadays is, is a it is a larger theropod, so it is kind of in the same sort of vein. Uh, it's it's got a lot different of a look, obviously, than this big like kind of weird smooth noodle boy. Here's like the uh, here's the comparison of how it used to look like over time. This big this big thick boy lizard to then like the kind of upright tail dragging guy to the more modern one of these uh, uh, lean forward leaning theropods similar to other ones. Obviously, these interpretations have changed. And how far back do these interpretations go and how crazy do our earlier interpretations of dinosaurs get? Obviously, looking at this compared to what we just saw in terms of, of a Megalosaurus are two wildly different creatures. So how were people looking at dinosaur fossils and thinking about them even, even before now? The first person who might have discovered the first dinosaur bone uh, was in 1677, this individual, Robert Plott. And then I think that William, William Buckland, a geology professor at Oxford, uh, was the first one to identify a dinosaur fossil as a dinosaur, and that was in the 1800s, with Megalosaurus being the first one, quote-unquote, identified and actually called out. Iguanodon was another really early one, and a lot of people think that Iguanodon happened at around the same time, if not at the same time. Looking at how these interpretations happened, that was a long time ago. You know, it was 200 years ago that they were identified, 400 years ago that the first actual bone might have been recorded, but it's hard to believe that that is the first time that anyone has ever seen a dinosaur bone. These things just kind of pop up every now and then. The, feet, uh, the footprints, at least, are preserved in some drier climates, and the evolution of human storytelling, I think, reflects a lot of this. So I tried to look up and see how far back we think we can go with the idea that people might have discovered dinosaurs. And people were actually looking into and studying these types of creatures. Greece, Rome, Egypt, these are all cultures that were vastly advanced. Egypt was around for thousands of years, the Egyptian empire. One single empire existed for thousands of years. Different rulers, different rules occasionally, but were people in those time periods, finding fossils, finding evidence of these massive creatures, and doing something with them. Dinosaurs, mammoths, and myth in Greek and Roman times. I don't have this book, but I'm really debating getting it. And the idea here is that these fossils were being found, and they were being interpreted, and they were being developed into the mythologies of the time period. Griffins, centaurs, cyclopses, giants, all of these things could have arose by the Greeks and the Romans discovering dinosaur fossils and interpreting them in ways that made sense to them with their existing mythologies, their existing knowledge, and the level of science that they had at that time period. So when we look at this, we kind of understand, uh, uh, again, taking another step back in terms of where our interpretations as a species go towards paleontology, towards dinosaurs. Looking at the context of the time period, we have our modern day where everything is very fact-driven, very science-driven. We're looking to find the truth of what these dinosaurs look like. That's why we're exploring the options with feathers, with chunkier uh, uh, structures that don't necessarily look so skeletal, skin-tight, compared to the 90s, the, the 1900s and the 1800s, where they kind of took on a... It was a very display-based idea. We as human beings looked at dinosaurs as an entertainment source, so far removed from our own experience, our own history, that it's hard to kind of grasp the connection between the world that they were living in and the world that we're living in. So looking at dinosaurs from that standpoint, you know, we were making media about them. We were using them as a form of entertainment. We go to museums to look at them because they're so cool. It's novelty. And now we're looking at them 
from a standpoint of what can we learn from them? Are there things that we can figure out in our modern day that are derived from our knowledge of the ancient days, <laughs> the Paleolithic days, the, the, the primeval dinosaurid days? And then going back even further than what they were doing in the 1800s and 1900s of looking at dinosaurs as a cool novelty uh, uh, entertainment experience, we might be seeing people who are taking them as elements of their own religious experience, their, their, their mythologies, their legends, their stories, their culture is being inter uh, intertwined with potentially dinosaurs, paleontology, the study of these ancient things. And that's super fascinating to me. Fossils being displayed within Grecian temples. Uh, scholars looking at these descriptions and using them into uh, 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 their, their writings and things that they were doing. And it's really fascinating to think about because there is one specific example that I would like to talk about here from Greece. This here is the Cretan mammoth, a, a pygmy-sized mammoth from the Isle of Crete in the Mediterranean. Now, for those of you who are unaware, pygmies, right, pygmy-sized creatures, are something that happens when a population arrives in an insular island and gets cut off from the mainland through whatever reason, and they kind of micro-evolve uh, to have a smaller size because there's less food source available. So a smaller size benefits because you are more likely to not starve because you have less body that you need to fuel with the food. So a mammoth, which might normally be five, four, four times the size of this one, five times the size of this one, has shrunk down to uh, waist height. Still a massive head, but it's an elephant. What do you expect? What does this have to do uh, with what we're talking about? Obviously it's not dinosaurs, but it is quote unquote paleontology because it is a study of ancient and extinct animals. This pygmy elephant has this skeleton. This is what it looks like. Cretan dwarf mammoth. And that's what its dome piece looked like. And when you look at this, compared to one particular Greek myth of the Cyclops, you get a potential for interpretation here. Now, the big hole in the middle, as we know, is for the nostrils. That's the nostrils of the elephant, and the trunk kind of curves down through there. We have a Cyclops here with the tusks and the, the big teeth and angie stuff. So the question is, was the Greek myth of the Cyclops developed out of paleontology developed out of the discovery of Cretan mammoth fossils, fossils whose head would have been about this size, which is a pretty big head on a person. <laughs> but if they're finding just that, it looks relatively humanoid, but monstrous enough that it could have been something different. Finding it on the Isle of Crete, you know, ties in with the idea that Poseidon might have had involvement with the creation of Cyclopses, the connection to the water and everything being on the island. Odysseus calls, uh, says that the Cyclops lives on an island. It's very possible that this interpretation could have arisen out of these remains. Our myths, our stories, our legends from ancient times into modern are being developed and interpreted and influenced by our fascination with Paleontological study. I think that's that's really cool. Mythology has always been a really interesting mindset for me. I know that a lot of people kind of have that that same theory right now that like the reason why dragons show up in mythologies across the entire globe, people are finding dinosaur fossils and interpreting them as dragons. And I hold to that theory pretty strong. I also think that's the case. It's obviously very hard to prove because it's not like we have any examples of like a museum. <laughs> where people were like putting display of dinosaur fossils, you know? It's not like the Norse had long houses where they had, uh, you know, like a giant dinosaur skull hanging from the ceiling and being like, this is the, the skull of the great worm, <laughs> Fafnir, slayed by our kin. That's not, that's not really what people are doing. So it's hard to kind of tie that in concretely with archeological evidence. But looking at it from a theoretical standpoint, I think it's safe to assume that, that dinosaurs and, and dragons have a mutual a mutual source. So that's that's kind of what I wanted to talk about today in terms of how our interpretation of dinosaurs have changed over time. 
We're finding a lot of new things in today's age. Skin intact from dinosaurs. Potentially genetic material intact from dinosaurs. Our interpretations are moving away from these kind of lumpy, weird lizards. Away from the kind of skeletal, thin monsters. And into more scientifically analyzed and, and contextually rebuilt ideas. Signaling our shift as a species away from viewing these things as a source of entertainment and more as a source of scientific learning. And even further removed from the original ideas of these beings as monsters, myths, and legends created by the gods in ancient times to battle our heroes. That's, I think, the best way that I can attribute paleontology to archaeology. I think that after all of the time being asked, hey, what do you think about dinosaurs as an archaeologist? I think that I can finally give an answer. And it's not so much, no, I don't study dinosaurs, but I study the people who studied dinosaurs. And if people say, oh, you know, uh, if they ask any questions about dinosaurs, I'm just going to go on a long-winded rant about this subject. Until they go, okay, wait, I regret asking. <laughs> So there is still a tremendous amount to learn. I think that this hadrosaur fossil is going to be very fascinating to see how that develops. I think that everything else that we are learning about dinosaurs is continuing to grow and develop. Do I think that these modern interpretations that we have here are going to be the final interpretation? Absolutely not. I think that in another decade or two, we're going to see another, another line at the bottom of these posts indicating a new interpretation of dinosaurs based on new evidence that we've discovered. And I think that that's, uh, that's something for us to strive for as a species. Continuing to learn and develop and, and create new ideas of what we think constitutes a dinosaur. And what that means for us as human beings and our ideas behind dinosaurs. So anyway, that's my spiel. That's my dino spiel. <laughs> Thank you all again for coming in today and hanging out while we talked about dinosaurs. I hope that you all had a fantastic brunch. I hope that you guys get all of the coffee in your system that you need. 